Hello everyone, this is Roshni from Lexus and Company and today I'll be dealing with a case law with regards to Limitation Act of uh, 1963. The case law's name being Punjab National Bank vs. Surendra Prasad Sinha and uh, the citation being AIR 9, 1992 uh, SC 1, uh, 1815. So basically the facts of this case is that the appellant number one, that is uh, the bank, uh, uh, is, uh, has the Punjab National Bank has his branch in the village called Katmi and gives a loan for rupees fifteen thousand to the respondent, that is Surendra Prasad Sinha and his wife. Uh, so uh, on the date May fifth, nineteen eighty four. So basically, the Limitation Act is very important that you keep every single date in mind because dates are the essential part for Limitation Act. When the Limitation would act, uh, apply and at when at what what time the particular you know suit gets barred and everything it's based on the date so you have to keep uh, in mind the dates very well so the bank gives a loan on may 5th 1984 on the same date a sum of rupees 24000 was given to the bank to be deposited in the fixed deposit uh, which would uh, mature on november 1st 1988 by the um, uh, you know uh, by the respondent so what the respondent does is that he gets a loan of 15000 and also he deposits rupees 24000 in his account which would mature in the uh, in the date november 1st 1988 so uh, he also says that the uh, fixed deposit would stand as a security bond for the respondent in case if they fail to pay the debt okay so if you fail to pay the debt you can use the fixed deposit that i have in, uh, put in your bank is what the claim of the uh, respondent is. The security bond read as the bank has a sole authority to appropriate and adjust uh, uh, from the pro uh, proceeds of the uh, fixed deposit any time if the respondent fails to pay back the debt as promised. So, if I fail to if I fail to pay the debt, you just take the money uh, uh, that uh, I fail to pay from my fixed deposit and the proceeds of the fixed deposit is what the uh, respondent claims in this particular um, uh, uh, this thing case. And the bond uh, the bond also stated that the res uh, respondent gave the total authority to the bank to adjust the debt and dues and credit the remains to his personal savings. So in this particular case, the bank is given with the complete authority to do whatever they want with the money in case they fail to you know pay the debt and the remaining. Uh, money has to be put in the savings account of the respondent is the uh, contract that is made between this argument that is made between the parties in this particular case the ba uh, so what happens is that um, the the respondent fails to pay the money now okay the respondent has failed to pay the money to the bank and the court on the bank what it does is that it adjusted the debt and the uh, uh, debt uh, of uh, 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 14,250 rupees from the balance and the remaining amount is credited to the respondent's uh, savings account. Alright, so this happens in the month of, uh, in the year of 18, uh, 1989. Alright, so basically uh, one year after the maturity of the money. So now what happens is that the respondent gets angry with all these things and the bank adjusting the money and not giving him the money the uh, respondent gets pissed with all these things and goes to the uh, court and um, claims or uh, the uh, he places an argument that according to the uh, uh, according to the agreement and everything the debt the debt got barred by the limitation as on uh, may 5th 1987 so it's been three years and the debt is barred and uh, so thus the respondent's liability to pay the debt also stays extinguished from the said date so after after May 5th, 1987, the respondent has, uh, you know, no uh, duty to pay the rent, bec uh, debt because, uh, uh, you know, the Limitation Act applies and uh, the time period for getting the loan is over. And the total sum of rupees 41,292 has to be de uh, deposited in the respondent's personal account, uh, but only rupees 14,000 has been deposited. Therefore, ap appellant is criminally embezzled the said amount. He says that I have uh, after the fixed deposit has matured, he has. To, he had to get rupees 41,292 but in his account it was deposited for only 14,254 rupees. So the respondent says that uh, the appellant, uh, appellate has uh, you know criminally took away his money and uh, uh, the bank has cheated him. So this is the claim placed by the respondent. The appellant, uh, the respondent also says that the appellant has committed uh, offence under section 409, 109, 114 of the Indian Penal Code. So these are the contentions placed by the respondent. Now we'll look into the contentions placed by the appellant. So uh, the appellant say, appellant say that there was a 
proper contract signed between the parties that the bank is given with the complete authority to you know adjust the money after the maturity of the fixed deposits in case the debt has uh, you know uh, is left unpaid so the same contract was also executed thus the bank has extreme authority to take over the money is so, a uh, contention laid down by the um, uh, appellants on behalf of the appellants so basically right now the issue in hand for the court is that did the bank create a criminal offence by under section 409 109 114 of the indian penal code by adjusting the debt and the dues of the uh, Respondent uh, by using the fixed deposit money after the debt got barred after by the Limitation Act, and uh, we already saw this is the contention and of the respondent that uh, the bank has committed a criminal offence, and also the scope of Section Three of the Limitation Act in the given case. So how how much does Section Three of the Limitation Act apply in this particular case is also the question in hand in front of the uh, courts. All right. So basically, the decision of the lower court is that the district court held that. Uh, the bank is liable and held the bank has committed a mistake by adjusting the money uh, as a you know suit was barred by limitation the high court also held the same um, with regards to this matter so basically the bank has committed a uh, crime with uh, under section 409 one, uh, 109 and uh, Uh, 114 of the IPC is what the court has held uh, in this particular case. That is the lower court. That is the district court and the high court. But when now the case is in front of the Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court says is that what is the decision of the Supreme Court stands? We all know that the limitation. Uh, the co court says that the limitation act must be read in such a way that its rules does not restrict the rights, but bars only the remedy when the period is elapsed. The lim no, uh, we all know that uh, the laws are created to protect the rights of the people. People. and no law in this country should affect the rights of any people and the uh, limitation act also should not affect any kind of rights given to the people so the rights cannot be affected but the remedy can be affected by the limitation act section 3 of the uh, limitation act does not affect the parties from invoking their rights but prevents only the remedy um, that was entitled to them the right to debt continues to withstand in the spite of uh, remedy being bar barred by the law itself even though your even though the law bars your remedy to get that money from the particular party your right still remains is what the court this uh Supreme Court has held in this particular case the right provided to the party can be exercised in any manner in any manner and not by the means of suit only even uh, just just by filing the suit it cannot be you know you, you cannot say that uh, i have filed the suit so uh, the right is there and the person didn't file the suit so the uh, the particular you know right is being extinguished and something you cannot say that you uh, the liability of the respondent to pay the debt stands still even though there is no remedy exists and even though uh, even though you know a suit a uh, suit has not been filed the right to you know get back the debt uh, is still stands with the bank and it can uh, it uh, it adjusted the money with the fixed deposit and it is highly justified and it does not violate uh, sorry section 3 of the limitation act is something that was held by the supreme court itself the um, court also highly criticized the decision given by the uh, high court uh, stating that it gave, it is a grave error to quash the complaint on filing that the bank acted on the prima facie uh, highly uh, 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 on the prima facie alone so the high court should have looked into every single uh, judgments and every single possible ways and uh, should have made sure the rights are being protected but instead the high court has committed a grave error by you know uh, letting the complaint uh, just uh, 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 pushing away the you know Uh, burden over the bank itself, and the respondent had abused. It also said that the respondent has abused the process and laid complaint against all the appellants without any prima facie case of harassing them or for vendetta. And uh, thus, this particular appeal was allowed, and the co uh, complaint was squashed. And um, this is one among the cases that is very interesting under the limitation act and every single uh, person should know about this act considering limitation act is one among the most important areas that every person should know while drafting or uh, filing a case so um, with this i end my video thank you so much